And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple. Coming to us straight from Third Option Ideas, the create the ho the home and hub of the periphery role playing game, the one the one and only Marshall E S Bala. Hi there. How are you, do you doing today? Not too bad. What's going on? It's go. It's go. It's going. It's been. It's been going. It's been going pretty good. Um, it's unfortunately still way too sunny out, but uh, but I will deal. <laughs> Not a fan of the light. Um, I'm not a vampire. It's just that it's just that too much sun gives me headaches. I getcha. I getcha. Um, I'm um, I'm too black to be a vampire. <laughs> then again, <laughs> then again, there's blades. So Mulligan. Right on. Um, but I liked. There's a bit of a tradition around here to right open with the humble beginnings. Um. So with that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick? All right, so the first time I ever played, it was a one-off game in high school. I was 16, sat down in my cousin's basement, played with his friends. It was kind of fun. I had sort of these ideas of, like, what it was like. Uh, we were playing third edition, 3.0, mm -hmm. of Dungeons & Dragons. It was fun. But I never really got into it until after high school. There was sort of this gigantic wave of D&D &D craze that happened because of Dan Harmon. Mm -hmm. And the uh, community show that came out, they had this big episode that was all D&D &D based. Mm -hmm. And there was this girl in our gr group of friends that wanted to play. We dusted off the old 3.5 books. We got a group together. And uh, the group actually stuck for a few years. Mm -hmm. um, now, this is back when I lived in Flint. I moved to Detroit, and I started playing around with different games, different systems. I jumped from 3.5 to Pathfinder 1st Edition, mm -hmm. and I was really big in the Paizo community. Well, I wasn't, I wasn't big, but the that I was into it mm -hmm. was pretty big. I was rather involved. Um, I was playing around with different systems, and I wanted to publish my own stuff. Mm -hmm. I did not have, you know, a platform to do it, really, because I was looking for, uh, like, freelance jobs. Mm -hmm. So I really got into the creative parts of the game. That's really where my focus came, because I really like creating my own stuff. So I really like the games that are, like, more setting agnostic. That's what I really got attached to in 3.5. So I stuck with the 3.5 system when I made my own. It's me. Wait. That's really where I come from. I come from this 3.5, produce your own stuff, you've got a functioning world, and you don't really need someone else's setting. Yeah. Now, when, since, you, since you mentioned being fairly active in the, in the um, forums with um, Paizo, mm -hmm. um, out of curiosity, were you, were you just as, were you, um, were you just as, just as jumping around when it came to, um, giant in the playground i actually wasn't really big over there although uh i mean i put out one piece of literature that people cared about that uh actually gave my name some meaning to it uh, i was master marshmallow i wrote a fighter guide back in 2016 that people were very attached to uh, i took it down for a little while when second edition hype was going up because i had a lot of advertising and stuff going on with it i put it back up uh, people have archived it, but that's really that's what my contribution to that community was. Yeah, and I did I um when I did some when I did some dig I um just I think I think I f I think I found somebody who who tried who tried to ca who tried to catalog that and a bunch of other guy a bunch of other guides. Mm -hmm. Yep, that was the Zenith Games guide. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's the that's the one I'm that's the one I'm looking at. Um, and do you now? 
with some with some people they st they may have started with D and D, but then they jumped but then they jumped around into other systems over the years. Would you would you say that you've largely um, focused or focused around the D twenty umbrella? Uh, I have. Uh, I've played around with like D ten systems before, and we played around with uh, what's it called the TriStat system, which is all like two D six. We've played around with all sorts of different systems at the house, and we've done things that are tabletop that aren't necessarily role-playing games as well, mm -hmm. like card games. Uh, you know, you'll have those card games. They're not TCGs, but you'll get one deck that's like, this is the dungeon that you go through, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, deck builders. Right on. Uh, what is it? Dungeon Crashers, Munchkin. There's all sorts of games that I play. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm a big fan of the tabletop. I like having people around. So, yeah. So when so when th when th and of course when things go wrong when you have people around, there's other people to share the blame. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Now there's uh, fingers to point. Now um, it is it, it is interesting that th that 3.0 was the was the start since a lot of people that I've spoken with who got who got their start with. The D twenty system as we as we now know it um, got their start with three point five, and honestly, pro in the in the long run, they're probably the better introduction since there's a lot of a lot of stuff in um in three point oh that was kind of jank. Right, um, there was a lot of ugh, the math underneath all of it was just so jumbled up. So when I was going through it, mm -hmm. I learned something. When uh, Monty Cook and his crew were writing this book, they wrote the magic system first. And so, like, their physics engine is all based off of their magic system. You have to read the magic system to understand how the game works. Mm -hmm. It's really weird that the game has that backwards relationship. And if I... I do, al I do, also, rem I do also remember... Um, and I, I talked about this when I did the Valley of the Judged episode on the um, Sorcerer. Apparently, one of the designers, Skip Williams, absolutely hated the sorcerer in the, in um in 3.0. He had apparently yes. done a lengthy rant on the matter. I I can't unfortunately I can't find the I can't find the rant so so I don't know exactly what he said. I just know that he wasn't fond of it. And um, there were cer there were certain um setups that ha that had issues. Um. I think I think it's I think it's more the I think it's more the fact that the that the whole 3.0 was trying to have a unified approach as op as opposed to um as opposed to second when it came when it came to its mechanics and um some th some things didn't make the translation as gracefully I th I think that that it's, and yeah that's true that's true. There's a lot of things that just get janky and they get weird. And, you know, you're handling things in this way that's parallel, according to the game rules. You know, you're doing the thing right, but it just doesn't... The effect at the table isn't... doesn't jive with what you're expecting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of dissonance that happened in that. I have attempted to clear that up in mine. Yeah. Now, that that does that does bring me to, to um, Periphery. Now... As as I understand, you are do, you are doing this as a um, as a uh, under the under the OGL, of course. But you but mm -hmm. um, but you've put out a you put out a different system reference thing, and you've talked about having this be setting agnostic, which is interesting to me because D and D and Pathfinder have baggage when it comes to set when it comes to setting. I.e., the whole Absolutely. will they will they won't they um, attitude when it comes to setting that I've been very critical of over the years. Yeah, that's actually one of the main things that got me inspired to do this in the first place. Mm -hmm. I was actively participating in the second edition playtest for Pathfinder, oh, you and do, huh? the direction that that game went in with the way that they have all this stuff sort of baked into your choice at first level. Mm -hmm. That kind of it sort of sets you on this linear path where you don't really get that many choices to make or that many meaningful decisions. Like for the Pathfinder characters, it's like you get four different paths that you can really pick from, and you just kind of get to choose the pace at which you go through them. 
Mm-hmm. And I didn't really like how uh, fifth edition, when you're playing it, I feel like as a character builder, as somebody that looks for the creativity aspects of it, I feel like I get limited after like third or fifth level. Like my choices are done. I'm just sort of waiting to see what I get from the devs. Mm-hmm. So I wanted the entire philosophy of my approach to this game to come from, I want you to be able to express the game that you want to play. I want you to be able to actually have it with some rules that will be vague enough to where you can capture everything, but, you know, that uh, difficult curve to have a balance between how specific it needs to be and how vague it needs to be for it to still be open enough for you to have a role-playing game in it. Mm Mm-hmm. No. So I have hopefully yep. come up with something. Uh, what I've expanded on more is the alignment system. When you get into it, mm-hmm. you'll find I, uh, I did a lot of work on figuring out how to fix paladins. Oh, bo- oh boy! <laughs> don't e- don't even get me started on on um, on al- on alignment based stupidity. Like if I could make a ridiculous overselling claim about my product, I'd say that I have fixed the lawful stupid paladin problem forever. Lawful stupid is only one part of the problem. Yeah, that is absolutely correct. Because a not, the big is it's just the most it's just I'd say lawful stupid is the most popular example of the of the problem. The mm-hmm. the pro- the problem is when when certain when certain classes are have to be constantly in some kind of alignment, otherwise they stop gaining levels in that class. Um, paladins paladins are the are the most popular example. Um, and rogues are another. Bar- also barbarians. Mm-hmm. Um, and in my in my opinion, the stance I've always had on the whole nine alignment system is that once you when you have it in a manner of these are the good pantheons, these are the bad pantheons. This is what this is how much or how they like or dislike you. It works reasonably okay. When you try and have it be a morality system, is when the problems start. Exactly. And so I did a whole bunch of research, I read a whole bunch of literature, and I broke down and made a complex system that sort of goes underneath it. Mm-hmm. So I've got these five alignment pillars. Let me pull up my document so that I can actually cite the correct things when I say them to you. Pull up characters. So I have these five pillars, and every time you make a character... You're going to sort of be investing ranks into these Mm -hmm. that tell you what this character's values are. So that way, no matter what the character is and no matter what the player is, you can pick this up, look at it like a little map, and sort of understand where this character's coming from. So that way you could roleplay them in any scenario, Mm -hmm. ideally. Um, So I've got these five pillars. They are conflict, like conflict resolution. Uh, loyalty, purity, justice, and policy. Three of them are tied to the good evil axis. Two of them are tied to the law chaos axis. Mm -hmm. And your character not only makes a choice based on how they feel about these certain things, but then you also have a number investment that's based off of your character's level. Another critique of the 3.5 system is that there was never any, like, tangible use for the charisma stat, like, for your character. It doesn't do anything for you. It's not important. For my system now, it's tied to your aura, which is part of your alignment, and it's calculated into this number that you get. Mm-hmm. So, um, in playtesting, all of my alpha testers have told me that the alignment system is the most fun part of my game, because it lets them have really com- complex and intricate characters. And I also have a background system that is designed to be exactly as intricate. So I wanted to focus more on letting people actually make the characters that they wanted to make. Mm-hmm. As opposed to having like a list of 20 random character quirks that nobody really wants to play. Yeah. And one of the, now um when it, one of the uh, one of the other big um one of the other big things that I've had a mixed attitude with over the years with the D20 system as a whole 
is skill use because and this is something that I've this is something that I've said over the years and it's something that always gets some tra- some uh, traditionalists hot under the collar. D&D does not do skills well because it was never designed from them from the outset. Um if you need if you need an ex- and by that I mean the skill system was always in the AD and D days, and the o, and the um, OD and D days. If you want to go, if you want to go really far back, was never designed as a, as in the same way that skill systems are with a whole swath of other games that use skill systems. Like you try Stat, it is has its skill system baked it baked in to it from the get go. Um, World of Darkness, same thing. Shadowrun, same thing. Cyberpunk, same thing. All these, all these games have their skill system ba- baked in, baked into them instead of them being a subsystem. And th- you, because of that, you also have the in- instance of a character, li- a character like Conan is shown to have a bunch of different skills at his disposal. Yet, if you try and use Conan in D and D setup, um, he's not going to be able to have as many skills, or he's going to be useless in so many of them. So, So, yeah, that is a gigantic problem, and it was a huge one to tackle. Uh, So for my system, um, I actually tapped into a lot of the optional Unearthed Arcana rules that were like patches that you could apply to 3.5 to make it a different game, make it play a little easier. Uh, You know, those after-the-fact kind of rule packs that they would put out. Um, one of them allowed you to have your characters, instead of having to invest individual ranks every level, mm-hmm. you would have a ratio of how many skills you would have trained versus how many skills you would have untrained, and then the values that you would plug into those would associate with your level. Uh, I do that with my system as well. So for my game, uh, I do a full level, half level progression for basically everything in the game. Um, if something is going to have a full progression, you're going to add your full level to it, mm-hmm. plus a d20. If it has a weak progression or a poor progression, you're going to add half your level, plus a d20. Um, obviously, you're going to add in your ability score, just like you would in 3.5. And from there, uh, the DCs have also been scaled to be a little bit more reasonable, because there was a lot of silly math involved with how they calculated skills, because you had to add up to four ranks over your level and it was it was just goofy so i tried to simplify all of that and give you a skill system that was intuitive uh so that there's not 40 different skills for every niche little thing you might think to do uh i have a more upside down approach to it i have a small number of skills that you can then specialize into the different types of things that would have been those niche scenarios Depending on what kind of character you want to make. Yeah. Now, when it co- when it comes to when it comes to skills, one of the big one of the big um, elephants in the room is has been knowledge skills because there there has been plenty of ge- there's been plenty of games that try that try and have e- that try and have each subject be its own be its own knowledge skill and it result and it's one of the biggest contributors to um, skill bloat. This How- is. Solid. Yeah. Um, I wanted to approach this in a way that mechanically matched how the game was organized Mm -hmm. so that the game sort of follows this common theming functionally, like what the system does. So I have four different, they're called schoolings in my game. Uh, It's like a formal education in this type of subject. Uh, They are arcana, culture, Cosmology and nature. Uh, these are your four skills that you use to identify creatures, like creature types, in the middle of a fight. Um, and these are also what you use to gain access to different types of spells, as well as what you use to traverse the world. Uh, so I have narrowed it down to four that I've decided are important. And the bestiary, the creatures that you might have to fight, mm-hmm. they're all organized by these as well, as well as the different spell sets. All, all right. Now, when it, now um, that does br- that does bring me to 
to um spe that does bring me to spells and when now I have um I have a complicated history with the with the um spell slot model. I've made that very clear over the years. <laughs> And you may like my system then, right. because I also have that same issue with it. All right, I will, I will, um, I will drop the pretense on this. I have never fully liked the Vancian spell slot model. At best, Either I, I. To at best, I tolerate it. I and the and um, whenever I whenever I would run, um, three whenever I'd run three point five, I would always use. Um, and M I would always use an MP system when I would when I and of course when I'd run say four, when I'd, when I'd run say fourth edition I didn't need to have a problem because it had the AEDU setup. Um, when I ran when I ran fifth edition it was back to square one. Although now now spheres of power is out and I've been using that instead for my for my five E um, spellcasters. But I played a little bit with spheres of power and Pathfinder. Mm -hmm. Um, so. In 3.5, there was also the Psionics system, which was a point-based system. Yes. It was super-duper complicated and required you to know the square of your level and divide it by two all the time. It was silly. It was dumb. Mm -hmm. I didn't like how complicated the math was. But uh, there, in that same Unearthed Arcana rule set that I used for skills, there was also a rule set that converted spells into this system. Now, my spells are not the same as what you'll find in 3.5. Mine are simplified. Um, they're a little bit broader. Mm -hmm. So I have a total of, I think it's 64 base spells in the game. Uh, each one of those has seven different orders, so it comes up to a total of somewhere close to 500 spells. Mm -hmm. um, all of these are organized by school, and they are also organized by order. So your order, that's what spell level is. I use a different word because I don't want to use the word level for everything. That was another critique I had of 3.5. You're, you're not the only one who ha who has that critique. The guy behind um, Heroes Against Darkness was very harsh on that. Yeah, so because of the, yeah, the rules around it, I wanted to change up what the words are. So now you have different spells of different orders, and that tells you basically how much energy goes into it, how big of a spell it is. Mm -hmm. And I numbered them 1 through 7, an easier number to play with than 9. Um, and when you go to cast a spell, I also have a spell point system. I call it SQ. It's your spell quantity. Mm -hmm. uh, this number is based off of your character's caster level, which is based off your level, uh, plus your ability modifier that goes towards your spell casting. Then, from this pool of resources, you spend points numbering the spell order in order to cast the spell, and it's that simple. Oh, and I, I can definitely, uh, I can definitely get, I can definitely get behind that that kind of thing. Um, now. A big, pr a big, pr a big problem. There's a couple of problems that I've that I've had when it comes to um, spell casting as well. One of them is what um, Asper has called "everybody uses the same stuff," i.e., it doesn't it doesn't matter if you're casting spells as a wizard, casting spells as a cleric, or casting spells as a druid, or God help you, casting spells as Godzilla. They all end up they all end up mechanically activating the same way. Um. The other the other issue that's happened is so much attention goes to the casting classes that anybody who isn't a caster is gimped. This was a huge hurdle to get over because uh, I went through it took me like six months and three revisions to redo this spell list and do all my spells because this problem that you have goes even deeper than what you describe because between the different classes. There's favoritism in who gets the best spell lists and who gets the list with all the spells that are worth reading and who gets the list with the spells that aren't. Bard. Um, especially when you're trying to compare different schools of magic. Mm -hmm. You'll find when you get into the divine classes, there's like nothing for illusion, nothing for enchantment. There's no, like almost nothing for necromancy. Mm -hmm. It was really hard to try to find concepts to fill these roles. So I attempted 
to streamline how all of these spells work. Now, this is going to be a... It's a table, basically. Mm -hmm. There are four different spell lists. Every single one of them is divided into eight different schools. And between those eight different schools, there are two different spells. I can go over that again if you want me to. No, no, no need. I think I think I get I think I got the picture on that. Um. So as a when you are a spellcaster mm -hmm. at level one in my game, uh, you get either the adept or the scion feat that determines what your starting spell list is. Uh, if you start with the adept list, there are sixteen different spells that you have access to. Then once you add another one onto it, uh, like Arcane, Nature, or Divine, mm. you'll add another 16 spells so that every character, sort of like how clerics worked in 3.5, know, quote unquote, all of these spells. And then you'll have a short list of them that you would have in your repertoire every day that you can then cast spontaneously from using your SQ. Mm -hmm. Now, when it... Now... Given, given that now, when it comes to the whole martial end of things, now obvious, obviously, mm -hmm. um, the, obviously, there's there's going to be the usual affair when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to martial characters. But one, but I want to specifically focus on on feats because I'm inevitably going to have to going to have to talk about the feater in a minute. Um, feats, it feats in three in three point in three point five. And to a slightly lesser extent, Pathfinder were were um were they were certainly a chains certainly, are an abomination. Yes, would it surprise you at I all? Got if you, I, homie. Would it surprise you at all if I say that Whirlwind Attack has been my whipping boy for years? Because oh, of the absolutely, and uh, yeah, no, that one's really, really bad. Why do I need Spring Attack to be able to do this? Um. I definitely hear you on that one. So one of my design goals was to completely get rid of those. Um, in fact, I didn't even want to have prerequisites when I first started out. I wanted you to be able to pick anything that you wanted a la carte. And what I wanted to do with all of the different feet chains, like the things that you would have to take another feat to get another ability in the same vein, uh, all of those I either... Um, crammed them all into one feat, like, you get all of these abilities at once, or I had it be a feat that scales up with your character's level. Mm -hmm. So if you pick this feat at level 1, it's not going to be as powerful as if you picked it up at level 7. But if you pick it up at level 7, there's no point in giving you a level 1 ability. So it'll still work like you have it at level 7. Mm -hmm. and or 8, or whatever it scales at. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, uh, prerequisites was a really, really silly concept when it came to feat design, um, but it was also tied into their class system. It was tied into the prestige class system real big. Mm -hmm. You had to know, you know, all of the different things that let you do this class. Uh, that was sort of my inspiration, so I don't have no feat prerequisites, but when it comes to martial characters specifically, I have a whole list called martial feats, which none of them have other feats as prerequisites. Some of them have ability score prerequisites because they take you down a particular path fighting wise. Mm -hmm. um, but you will find that I have cleaned up what all of those different feat chains were and broken them into what their individual abilities would have been. And so you get to basically just grab that idea you only have to take the feat once, and then you can move on. Mm -hmm. Now, something I something I do find interesting is since you brought since you brought up um, classes is there's a significantly smaller um, amount of amount of classes in this setup than there than there is in um, say three point five. It's three point mm -hmm. five. You had let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Was it eleven or twelve? Eleven. And 11. you, cur putting aside NPC classes, you only have six classes. Plus multi class for seven. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um. So I based this rule set off of another of the unearthed Arcana sets mm -hmm. of 
this is sort of the baseline for what the entire system ended up looking like because yeah. I did not like I don't like when you have to pick a class and then all of your path forward is chosen for you. Yeah. I don't like how much it's broken up. I think it needs to be a little bit simpler. So I like these as base skeletons that more or less tell you what the math is for your character, and that's about it. Mm -hmm. So I know what my base attack bonus is. I know how many spells I get. I know what my bonus feats are. Once you have that stuff down, uh, I really want the rest of the game to sort of be a la carte. So you have the ability to sort of prestige out in whatever way you see fit. I wanted to capture this feeling from 3.5 of being able to multi-class around without making you do all of the math. So now, in my system, rather than level by level trying to pick what class you're going to get, um, I guess I can just explain the base system. Yeah. Um, so uh, you have, when you make a character in my system, you have an anatomy. That's my replacement for race, because it's a better word to use, because it also describes monsters and other creatures pretty well, mm -hmm. without having to refer to its race, because sometimes it's not a race that you're talking about. Uh, you're just talking about its physical body. Uh, and then you have your class as well. Uh, you get a hit die for each of them now. Uh, this is part of how I made the math simpler. Because instead of making you do a multiplier for your constitution modifier, you just get another die that you get to roll or average every level. Um, in addition to that, every even level, you're going to get a class feature. Every odd level, you're going to get an ability boost. Mm hmm and at every level, you get to pick a feat. That's the game. And when it comes... Now... When it comes to... When it comes... When it come, now, obviously, I, I saw... I yes, I see the... I see the um, setup. And something that, something that I find inter interesting is that even, even martial classes have some po some possibility of being able to dip of being able to dip into um casting if they so choose Absolutely. so um as a game design perspective i looked at what classes like ranger and paladin were based on uh and they have a lot of overlap with like the fighter and the barbarian and all of this stuff i was trying to figure out how could i make a rule set to where if i wanted to play a ranger like from 3.5 could I do it still uh, while still having this setup? So you can uh, still have access to your different spellcasting uh, packages. So you'll either be like a four-level caster or a six-level or a nine-level, mm -hmm. like what you would have had in 3.5. You can do that now in my system by just taking the feats that are associated with those abilities. Now, everything in my system uh, is... Unlike the 3.5 system where it's all based on spells, mine's all based on the different feats, the different abilities that you can pick up in the game. So every anatomy is a package of four different feats. Every class is a package of four different feats. Mm -hmm. They give you a sort of baseline package for how to build off of. If you wanted to just dip into those feats, even though you started with a different package, you can still slowly build into those resources. Mm -hmm. And... When so look, you never really lose out on the ability to actually, you know, dip in. Mm -hmm. When I look at the class design, the thing that the thing that comes to mind a lot for me is um is is Star Wars Saga Edition, oddly enough. And I'm wondering if that if that was at all an influence, or if or if that's coincidental on my part. It's coincidental. I've played around with it once or twice. Uh, some people have thrown some ideas for different types of mechanics I could steal from it, but I've never actually really played it. Yeah. Um, the main the main difference is that you don't have the you don't have the um, talent system that it does, but it is. But that one is very is still highly focused on on um, on feats and talents when it comes to its class design. Um, now. When it now, when it comes to one of the one of the things that I one of the things that I saw that I was a bit I was a bit curious about is when I looked through the documents I saw the atlas sheet and I'm guessing that I'm guessing this ties into the goal of ha of having this of having this game be setting agnostic. Absolutely, that is totally part of what this is. So the atlas sheet is just like a character sheet. 
but instead of filling it out for a single person, you get to do it for an entire city. Um, so if you look at the front of it, it's laid out just like a character sheet is. Mm -hmm. The city, the civilization itself, can have its own alignment. Uh, and then it has, instead of a background, it's got a box for you to put in sort of demographic data so that you know what kind of people are there. Mm -hmm. um, so where you would have things like... Here, let me pull up. Where before you would have things like your motivation uh, that gives you an influence on your alignment as a character. In this, I would have something like, what's the religion like there? And that tells you what kind of spell casting is available and what kind of technology they have. Uh, there's, let's see if I can pull these up real quick. So I have economy, culture, politics, religion, and age. Uh, and this gives you a sort of description of what the people are like there, what it's like interacting with the government. Like, is the city guard, uh, do they have very heavily armed? Do they have high-level guys? What kind of magic is available? Are they rich? Do they have a lot of magic? Um, so there's different scales for you to fill out so that you have the ability to really have whatever kind of city you want so that you can tell the story that you want to tell. Mm -hmm. Now, within now within that within that kind within that kind of approach is the, I've now the on, the only the close thing that comes to mind with this sort of thing is fantasy craft and there's not there's not a lot of overlap between you, between what you're doing and what they are. But in both cases, there it, there does there does seem to be an effort to give give life to um, settlements and something that was um was prevalent in early D and D, even if it was undercooked, and something that kind of fell by the wayside in third edition is the ability to ha to um essentially ha essentially establish a following, Esta get getting mi getting minions and the like, and po and possibly. Having a having a more permanent spot in the in um, the world, um, is some is some of that is some of that going to be integrated when it comes to this atlas system that you've set up? It actually is. So in the adventure system itself, um, part of how these civilizations themselves develop, uh, they have a scale that goes from plus one to plus five. And this relates to a particular class feature that whatever the leadership of that civilization has. So it'll work with either the knight class or the leader class. Mm -hmm. um, you have to have the class feature, though. You either have to have the leadership or the renowned class feature. So you can multi-class into it. As long as you've got that class feature, then you're going to have the ability to amass people. Mm -hmm. um, I designed it around the ability to still have sort of a level gate so that when you get to a higher level civilization. Um, I've also baked in things like what random NPC levels you're going to run into depending on how developed the civilization is. Because that part of world building was one of the things that was really difficult to not have a tool set available that let you know, hey, if I'm going to a small town, I'm not going to run into a level 20 guy unless the DM put him there. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to bake all of the rules for who you could run into um, and have that be tied to the leadership role. So if you were running a game, let's say, where your players wanted to sort of do this, one of them would likely pick an option that let them have this leadership class feature. Uh, and then through their role playing, they would try to progress this civilization as they level up. Mm-hmm. Now speaking of cl speaking of classes, um, first off, it does it does seem like the that the NPC class is not is not meant to be some wayside thing the way the way it is where um, in three point five a lot of the NPC classes were low were low tier things. Um, but what I'm cu what I'm curious about when when it comes to when it comes to each of the classes is what their what their equivalents might be might be from um. From D from D and D and Pathfinder, and okay, so I'll, yeah. I'll start it. I'll start at the top and work and work downward. Since some of these I can I can 
get I can reasonably assume what their analogs are, and some of them might, some of them might take a bit of work. So I'll start okay. at the top with tactician. Gotcha. Did you have a question? Or did you want me to go? Um, I want this on this. I want I wanted to go. What's some with each of these classes? I'm going to go down. What some what some of their analogs in um, D and D and Pathfinder would be. Okay, so the tactician uh, was an architecture that's designed to let you reproduce things like the fighter and the ranger because these are classes that picked up extra feats as they leveled up. Mm -hmm. um, so. I think, do we need to go on a rant about fighters not having enough skills? Or can I just give them skills and we're, we can just move on? Um, I, I already, I already, I already kind of brought that up and, I already, and I've already made the joke about the fighter being better called the feeter. Right. Yeah. No, I got a... Uh, so, I, they get skills now. Mm -hmm. um, so, my skill system is very much reduced. There's like 19 skills for you to invest into. Yep. Uh, you get a number of skills trained based off of your class. Uh, they give you some specific skills, like the tactician gives you agility, athletics, and either expertise or schooling. You get to pick one. Uh, plus six more. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on top of that, you'd also train skills numbering your intelligence modifier. You know, the three, five. Um, this intention, uh, you can also do, like, there were some full base attack versions of, like, the monk... Uh, there was a couple of psionics uh, classes. This is just supposed to be your full base attack bonus class. Mm -hmm. And if you needed to pick up extra class features for it, what the old class features used to be have been rolled into the different feats. So, in intentionally, you're supposed to be able to build either the fighter or the ranger, or even technically the rogue, because I don't have that medium base attack as a tier of a class. Mm-hmm. So, so next would be the sage. <clears throat> so yeah, sage is very obviously my wizard analog. Um, it's also able to replicate things like the scion. Uh, this is a class that picks up extra meta magic feats. Um, it's sort of the spellcasting equivalent to the tactician because all of its class features more or less do the same thing. But instead of applying to weapons and attack rolls and picking up martial feats, this applies to metamagic feats and spells and all of those. Mm -hmm. So these two classes are sort of meant to be inverses of each other. All right. Knight. The knight is the class that is supposed to capture what used to be the paladin, mm -hmm. but I wanted to do it in an alignment free. So, as a baseline, you get a smite ability that isn't attached to any alignment. Um, this is designed to be your tank class. So, as you level up, your smite gets to target a different number of people, where you get to draw the aggression from those guys, because they take a penalty to attack anybody that isn't you. So, you're trying to get their attention so that you're taking the hits instead of your allies. Mm-hmm. So next would be Channeler. All right. Channeler is a combination of some different ideas. There was a bunch of different elemental channeling guys. You know, your avatar idea, the people that want to be able to focus on one element and be able to do cool stuff with it, mm -hmm. as well as having your clerics that venerate positive energy and can do bursts of healing and light and all that cool stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I needed to come up with an idea that wrapped it all into one. So I invented some mechanics that were based off of the cleric's uh, sort of ability to heal, as well as some stuff from, let's see, sort of based off of a spell, actually, because you also get to reshape it as you level up. Yeah. Uh, and the, uh, the cool thing about this, the thing that I really liked was... As you level up, you get more and more resources. You get more and more access to things like picking up key, which can just give you extra uses per day. Mm -hmm. Now, this is this will probably be this will probably be one of the more straightforward ones, but Berserker. All right, Berserker is actually not as straightforward as one would think. So, mechanically speaking, this is supposed to capture both the barbarian. And the monk 
as well as the Psychic Warrior, all wrapped into one class. Um, you have a binary choice at level 1. You get to pick either Zen or Rage. Those are your two modes to switch. They determine basically whether or not you're going to be based off of Wisdom or Constitution as you level up. All right. You get a different sort of little ability. Um, and then these are the different stats that you would focus on as you progress. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have different identities attached to them. So the battle trance that you go into prevents you from casting spells unless you go into the psionic stuff, which is sort of how it already worked in 3.5. I just tried to integrate it more cleanly in here. All right. Um, summoner. Summoner. All right. So this was supposed to be a druid without any attachments to nature. So I asked myself, what was the druid's thing that it does that's just as a class? Because the shape-shifting stuff, you don't really get freedom when it comes to your shape-shifting. There's a pretty restrictive list. Because uh, you're just stuck with certain types of animals of certain sizes at certain levels. And I didn't want... I wanted it to be a little bit more free than that. So the other thing that they got that was really cool was spontaneous summoning. So I invented a mechanic that lets you get a certain number of summons per day. And this is fun because as you level up, you basically get to build your little guys that you summon. Mm -hmm. um, which lets this be the pet class. Um, and then you get your choices at level 1 based on from different lists of what type of creature you're going to pick. And then as you progress, you get to add new feats to them and they gain more hit dice and level up as you level up. Mm -hmm. Now, when it, now multi, now, um, multi-classing, I, there's an interesting setup here because you essentially have it as its own class that is, that isn't technically a class. Um, yep. Instead, instead of, instead of doing the, con the convoluted, di the convoluted dipping it, dipping into stuff that, w that's, been all, been almost expected for a lot for a lot of for a lot of design. Right. So this was part of streamlining things and making it easier to level up because I want the level up process to be nigh instantaneous. I don't want you to have to think at all about anything except for your actual choices, what you want your character to do. I don't want all the busy work. Mm -hmm. So the classes are designed to where they all have two class features. Um and they advance every other even level, so every four levels, basically, and they alternate. Uh, with multi-classing, I give you the option of basically just picking any two. You have to pick one primary, and then either a primary or a secondary. That way, you get to dip in and have half of two different classes, and then depending on what you pick as your primary and your secondary, you also get to play around with your base attack bonus and saving throws and stuff. So as a baseline, this is the only class that gives you a three-quarter progression for both base attack and caster level. Mm -hmm. But if you chose to do something different with it, then you could get, you know, like a full base attack uh, plus, you know, uh, you get full base attack, half caster level, or full mm -hmm. caster level, half base attack. Mm -hmm. Or three-quarters for both. This is the class that lets you do that. If you wanted to reproduce something that looks like the Bard from 3.5, you'd likely do it using this. Which makes sense thematically for what Bards traditionally filled in parties when you played 3.5. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to the N when it comes to the NPC classes, um, as as mentioned before, it's clear it's clear that there's a bit that there's a bit more um, attention given to them than the um, NPC classes in 3.5. So, right. So in 3.5, uh, they were designed to be more or less just useless. The, they're there to give creatures that otherwise wouldn't have hit dice, like humans, mm -hmm. a reason to be there. Now, for my game, things get anatomy hit dice, so I don't need those useless NPC levels. I don't need to waste that page space for the book or whatever. Um, so my NPC classes are designed around actual functions that you're going to need as a DM, or as a narrator, or as an author, to throw challenges at your players. Mm -hmm. um, the leader 
is my attempt at having mobs or swarms or troops or whatever uh, you know game Oops. term you want to invent. They are now your followers. Mm -hmm. And they are attached to your leader. Your leader uh, gets to share their feats with them, and they get a certain number based off of their charisma as they scale up and level, to where they basically get a whole bunch of guys, they get a pool of hit dice that they get to distribute. Um, you get to decide when you're designing the encounter, I guess. Uh, we've played around with it a few times in alpha testing, where you basically get to just divide up these hit dice, depending on how many hit points you want these individual guys to have. So if you've got 20 hit dice, you could have 21 hit die guys that'll go down in one hit, or you could have four or five hit die guys that'll take three or four hits to go down. Mm -hmm. um, then they basically all have the exact same build as far as their feats go because your leader gets to decide what those feats are going to be. So it's streamlined. It's easy to know what all of their feats and abilities are because you design them based off of the leader. Now, what, now um, when it comes to animation... Um. Alright. Animation is for golems, animated objects. You can do simple, mindless undead with this. This is supposed to be for anything that is not a living thing. Uh, so in the game, uh, you'll, we haven't talked about objects yet, but objects also have hit dice. They have material hit dice. So I have anatomy hit dice and material hit dice. Uh, I based this off of the construct rules in 3.5. I wanted this to be a much more streamlined way to do constructs, but it had to include the rules for how to do all these other things. Um, so if you have an animated object, and there's different ways to create them in the game, there's rules for it, uh, you would grant it a certain number of animation hit dice, and that would tell you how many abilities that it gets and what its stats are. That's, this is what the rule set is for that. All right. Um, Apex. All right. So Apex and Paragon, I'm going to talk about together because I sort of had to design them together. Apex is the ultimate class. It's designed to be the hardest boss monster that your players are ever going to have to go up against. You use this for dragons. Mm -hmm. You use it for uh, outsiders, angels, and demons. You use it for your high-level fey. This is the thing that has full base attack bonus and full spell casting and full saving throw progression. This is your boss monster. Paragon is more or less the same thing, but instead of having full spell casting and all of that fun stuff, it just has no spell casting. It's designed around being the heaviest physical presence that you can have in the game. So as a DM, you might need a really strong spell caster or a really strong heavy hitting thing. These are the two classes that you would play with to make those two things. Um, in te has there ever been a situation where somebody's tried to talk their way into taking a ta multi-classing into, into Apex or Paragon? Way too many. <laughs> um, which I, you know, I put in the text of the game, you know, these are normally not four-player characters. Because of a balance issue, it's designed around making an encounter that's supposed to take on a group of players. Mm -hmm. So it's intentionally stacked in a way that gives it some extra resources. Um, but if somebody wanted to say, hey, I want to play a leader as a player character, I wouldn't have a problem with that as long as they weren't abusing it. You know, leadership, I thought, was so broken it needed to be its own class is basically what I came up with. I gotcha. Now, when it comes to when it comes to this has probably already been answered, uh, but when it comes to when it comes to creatures, um, are you ha are you having a setup where you have a defined bestiary, or are you or that or is that just another avenue of character creation? So it is an avenue of character creation. Um, when the thing is, is when I have to make a bestiary, I, I'm likely going to do one. Um, right now, the rule set is you have access to the types, subtypes, and how to build it. Um, so on demand, having just a fully built list of everything would be nigh impossible with the way that the systems work. There'd be mm -hmm. hundreds of them. Um, so 
if you needed a specific bestiary, chances are I would have those be associated with whatever campaign that I'm writing. Um, with whatever the actual game that I'm playing is, would have its own associated, you know, these are the encounters that I plan for you to play against. Because when I play the game, usually I end up having to make my own encounters anyway, because what exists in the book doesn't satisfy my players. But that's my gaming experience, typically. Um, when I go to do that type of stuff, I want it to be something that other people have the option to do. Like, if you wanted to build your own thing, under the licensing that I have, I want you as a participator, as a licensee, mm -hmm. to be able to put out your own stuff. So if you had your own bestiary that you wanted to make with this, go for it. It's I I, I certainly I'm, I'm certainly in appro in approval of that of that kind of thing since it's giving it's giving players the toolbox instead of having that be um myster a a mysterious thing that's only talked about in hushed tones. <laughs> yeah, I don't I also don't want it to be like a authoritative thing where like I am the creator, I tell you what all of this is. Like if you want to have a dog that is, you know, large sized and has poison or whatever, if in your campaign world you can BS it, go for it. Mm -hmm. So instead of giving you a set, you know, here are the creatures in this game, uh, here are the rules for how to build whatever creatures you want. It's a fantasy game. Do what you want. Yeah. Now, uh, Maximizing expression for both players and narrators mm -hmm. is one of my goals with this system. Which is, is, def is definitely admirable, because it's there's certain. Hold on a moment. Um, out of curiosity, this is this is given that I mentioned creatures. What's your what's been your take on challenge level? That's a very right. scub topic. Okay, so challenge rating is a silly, silly, horribly complicated math problem that nobody ever bothers to learn, and. It's like one of those things where the only place where you find people that actually know what it is is on the internet. Uh, I've never met somebody IRL that actually uses it. Um, and it's complicated. It's silly. I got rid of a numerical experience system, and I've decided that most of my challenges are going to be organized based off of this arc tier system that I have. So under the experience rules framework that you'll find... Uh, I describe what the different types of challenges that are appropriate. Um, when it comes to designing enemies, you're going to want to base their level the same as the character levels. Mm -hmm. You can see them as being one-to-one, -one, except that they're designed to be... You can do them as one-shots. If you need a group of characters, use the leader. Mm-hmm. Uh, or, you know, just you one or two NPCs. I don't want... I don't think it should be necessary for you to have to stat up an army. Not... Not as... Not as... I can certainly see... I can certainly see the... The, um... The need for that to not be the case, especially when you have a whole setup with the military end on the Atlas sheet. Mm-hmm. I could easily see somebody, um... Segwaying that into into integrating some sort of mass combat setup, um, you know, um, it's one of those things that I get asked by my alpha testers all the time. Uh, there are talks of doing another rule set, do, expanding the rules framework. Um, I don't think it's something that belongs in core rules because the core rules of the game focus on action and adventure, mm -hmm. and I don't think that the mass combat stuff really fits into that because that would really falls into some more politics and uh you know some more high level stuff that isn't your basic adventuring kit that you'd want from a core rule book. Yeah. But it definitely is something that I want to be able to expand into later. I do want it to be, you know, backwards compatible. Which is complete is completely understandable to me. Um because it's because um, it it's very it's very te it's very tempting to go to go all in with mass combat and by the t and by the time you've realized it you've created a whole new subsystem which I think is something you're trying to avoid. 
Mm-hmm. I th- I For think sure. that if you were that if you wanted to you that you that if you wanted to utilize um a mass combat system you'd want um and maybe I'm reading too into this you can tell me but I get the sense that you'd want it to be as um as integrated with it within the current umbrella as it is not creating its own um periphery part of part of the proverbial sandbox I love alliteration maybe <laughs> um so in the talks for expanding what the uh, the types of games that I have, we can seg into the different gameplay modes if you would like. Yes. Uh, so once we get out of experience, um, we'll get back into it once we uh, describe the gif- different game modes. Yeah. There are two game modes: action and adventure. So action is covering what used to be combat rules for three point five. Now this is just anything that happens at this time scale. So the different rules frameworks that I have are based on time scales. How long is a round? It's six seconds long. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you would have to go through the action system. Uh, I have a very similar system to what 3.5 had, but I got rid of full rounds and all of the confusion around them. So every turn, you get a standard action, a move action, a quick action, and a reaction. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you give a list of things that you get to do. Uh, the big thing that I've had a hurdle with in playtesting is making sure everybody knows what all of these rules are. Because most people are just trying to go based off of their assumptions of how 3.5 played. Yeah. And I've hopefully cleaned up the rules from 3.5, so it's simpler. Which I, I, can, cer- I can certainly get behind that, that kind of thing. And would it be fair of me to say that the adventure is, more, is on longer stretches of time? Absolutely. So in adventure mode, I actually have two different time scales. Uh, a regular adventuring mode uh, has time frames that are in six minute intervals called a billing. So every turn or round that you have in an adventure mode, you assume that you're doing something for six minutes. You, uh, you pick a goal mm-hmm. based off of something that you're trying to do, like in a room, like, hey, I'm going to pick this lock or I'm going to do this. Um, then you have... Six, basically, the game assumes that you're going to take six minutes to attempt to do this thing. That way, there's parallels to how action works. There are six rounds. Six. Um, it makes it to where there's ten of them in one hour, just like there's ten rounds in one minute. Uh, taking ten and taking twenty has then been updated and changed to where you're now taking... 10 billings to do something or taking 20 billings to do something which means you're either taking one hour to do it or taking two hours to do it um and you get extra dice rolls to add to your total bonus oh all right now since given given this given the adventure framework this is where this is where i'd ha- this is where i have to ask about one other Big, el- big elephant in the room. That was a ca- that was a case of I did not u- I did not use it because I don't feel like dying in crunch hell. Um, let's talk about item creation. Okay, <laughs> item creation is one of those things that was really, really like so abstracted out from how the world works that it just didn't make any sense to me. So I had to come up with a brand new different type of thing um, that was easy. And it's not. So I had to throw that idea out real quick. Uh, So my object system is a little bit more complex than how it was in 3.5, but it comes from a good place because hopefully it makes understanding the entire system a lot easier uh, from off-rip. Mm-hmm. So every object in the game has a quality associated with it. And that quality gives it a numerical bonus uh, when you attempt to make checks with it. So if it's a weapon, it'll apply on attacks and damage. Mm -hmm. If it's like an item that you would use with a skill, it'll give you a bonus on skill checks. Um, But as you scale up in the quality, in 3.5, you might remember there was a rule to where certain items had to be magical or have a plus one enchantment on it before you could do anything else. Yes. And that was one of those stepping stone rules. We got, I've gotten rid of that. Uh, now for us, we would have to make it a magical quality item, 
which numerically in the game, as far as like adding numbers to the D20, it does the exact same thing, but I get rid of that extra jargon. So now you make a magical quality item, and then once the item is magical in quality, you can then apply different magical effects to it. Mm -hmm. And those magical effects scale based off of... I have four different pricing scales. And magic items before, you'll remember, were real goofy with how like their caster level worked and what their creation requirements and you had to have this specific spell and you had to perform this specific ritual i've gotten rid of that kind of stuff mm -hmm. uh now you just have four different pricing scales and there's sort of this abstract rule about magic components themselves as in physical materials in the game that you burn up to make magic happen um and now you use that stuff sort of as your currency to make magic items with. So you're not spending experience from your character, you're not draining your life force or doing some other abstract thing that doesn't really have a tangible thing that makes sense in the game world. Uh, you know, I, I want to get rid of the gaminess of it and give you more of a, an actual story, something that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Now, when... That bring that brings me to the tr to the um, trade thing that I saw in and um, things like in things like weapons since um, may, since mundane weapons have have always ha have have had a ra have had a rash of bad for bad fortune where a lot where a lot of um, a lot of melee weapons especially end up coming across very samey. Um, yeah. So everybody uses longsword or a great sword until they read rapier or whatever that other eighteen to twenty weapon is, uh, and then they just run with that. In Pathfinder, it was the Nodachi. It was yep. just the most broken weapon in the game, and everybody just used it in every game, and it was boring and dumb. Mm -hmm. um, so my solution to that was to give all of the different types of weapon groups um, more options to be more interesting, so that they could be useful. You'll find in my system, I don't have a list of weapons for you to buy. I have eight different weapon groups. These are parallel to the eight different schools of magic. And you get to basically pick uh, from a gigantic list of traits when you buy the weapon or when you make the weapon. Uh, if you're a creator, you might have a different list of weapons that a blacksmith has. Like, okay, he's got a blade that's got uh, keen and oversized on it or whatever it ends up being. And you can produce the types of weapons that you'd get from 3.5 with this, but you have a lot more freedom. Oh. Uh, and you actually get to build these different types of weapons. For my sake, I envision having like different cities uh, that you would explore. Might sell long swords that have different traits, but they're still technically long swords because of the make of the weapon. Yeah. I want you to be able to have that type of flavor, but you have to be able to make it yourself. You have to be able to put it in there. I can I can certainly I can certainly see that and the uh, for me for me it's it's always been I I remember I remember a long I remember a few years back um John Wick no not not that one um had a had a lengthy rant about how much he hated equipment lists in RPG in RPGs because he didn't because there wasn't a whole, there wasn't enough of a difference between say different cap between different types of handguns or or the like. Um, this was in this was in his infamous "chess is not a role-playing game" rant, where he had also argued that balance isn't necessary. And I and a few other people pointed out that it's kind of rich coming from the guy who whose whose um, introduction to void magic in L5R was heavily criticized for how unbalanced it was. <laughs> um, oh boy, yes. So balance mm -hmm. is a weird concept. Mm -hmm. Um. One of the weird, hardest things to get over is associating the type of damage that you do with critical range. The idea that bludgeoning weapons can't do crits more often, that's the, that was my mental hurdle I had to get over. Mm -hmm. So now your critical range is not associated with the type of weapon that you have. Uh, it's associated with the weapon's complexity. How hard is the weapon to use? Mm -hmm. But then it turns into a trade-off. So if you invest the feats into being able to use an exotic weapon mm -hmm. of that group then it has a better crit range and you get access to its 
uh, every weapon group has a martial proficiency feature. So if you're proficient with the weapon group, you just automatically have access to this ability. Um, so for like blades, for instance, mm -hmm. on a critical hit, you inflict the bleeding condition. It's a blade. Mm -hmm. So on top of having access to all of that stuff, you would also be able to apply more traits to it which give your weapon, obviously, more abilities, mm -hmm. and it increases the crit range, uh, which does not require confirmation rolls in my system unless they've invested into armor fortification. I've sort of put that behind a feet block. All right. Speaking of, speaking of that, something I noticed when I was going over the classes is you don't, ha you don't have anything resembling the typical um, weapon and armor proficiency setup. Um, I sort of do. Uh, you'll find as you read through the different classes, mm -hmm. they come with feats built in. Every single one has four different feats. Mm -hmm. So, martial weapon proficiency is now a martial feat. So, anybody can take it, but if you're playing one of my martial classes, you get it off rip. You get it at level one. Um, and so what that feat does is it gives you access to proficiency with all of the weapon groups. So you get access to all of those little niche features that I just described, you would get access to all of them. Uh, the other feat that goes along with that is improved weapon proficiency, which only applies to one. So if you only have improved weapon proficiency, you improve it by one step. If you have both feats, then for that group, you would improve it by two. That way it doesn't matter what order you take the feats in, in order to advance your proficiency with any weapon group. Alright. Now, the the... When you mention when you mention criticals, um, is it fair is it fair of me to say that especially since you're not doing confirmation that criticals are more about putting an extra putting an extra effect than whether or not you're doing max or double damage? So um, sometimes depending on what you want to get out of the weapon. So I've got some abilities in there that add to what you can do on a critical. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think I call it wounding, where you get to add an extra die. Uh, that's what I do with critical hits, is you get to add extra dice instead of doing all of the multiplying and stuff. It's just add more dice. That way you do more damage. Because crits are going to happen more often in my game, because of the way I've designed the system. They need to be less devastating, uh, because I want them to happen more frequently. Now, crits are, crits in core were were obviously a 5% chance. Um because it because it was because it was always nat twenty or or is some with some weapons a ten percent chance because it was um, nat nineteen. Um, is 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 criticals still based on uh, still based on a natural die result or is it based on how many um how how over the AC you end up hitting? I actually really despised this rule from second edition of Pathfinder. Uh, it was fun in concept, but in practice, it made gameplay very boring. Um, at least I felt, because none of the monsters had variations to their AC. Uh, you know, you knew by every individual point what their AC was, and it just got... It was very gamey. Um... So for us, AC is. Ooh, hold on! I lost my train of thought there. Let me pull something up real quick. No worries. Uh, I need to pull up weapons. So when it comes to things like crits and AC, mm -hmm. uh, I wanted it to be easier to understand how these things interacted. Uh, I didn't want you to think like. It's so hard. I, I try to get out of the gamey stuff, and I want it to be like you get to narrate it, you get to describe it, you get to role play it. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to get out of the gamey terms, which I I can I can certainly I can certainly appreciate that. Now, with but with all with all that said, it de there definitely seems to be a there definitely seems to be a vibe of ta of. Of re of reconstructing what's pr what's present with it with within the within the uh, setup now a little bit mm -hmm. um so there's other things like uh there used to be a lot of rules around like improved critical you can't take until level eight mm -hmm. because they wanted to gate away like how effective criticals would be later on 
uh, like I said earlier, because I want them to happen more often, you can do things like put Keen on a weapon at level one. It's now a mundane thing. This is another thing that I did. You talked about mundane fighters yeah. not having enough abilities, not having enough influence on the game. Uh, one of the big things that I wanted to do was make it to where they did. So most of the abilities that used to be like magic abilities, you can now pick up as feats and actually just do them yourself. Like I trained myself to do this. I don't need magic. Uh, and then a lot of the weapon abilities, I just made mundane abilities that you can attach onto them. So hopefully that answers that question. Yeah, I can I can certainly get I can certainly get behind that, and I'll be I'll be looking forward to seeing how this kind of thing develops and what sort of broken ass builds people end up making out of it because you know that you it's know it's been that's rather fun. Um, it's been rather fun testing. Yes, let's let's hope that nobody tries to make something as ungodly as pun pun with this. I don't. Think I hope they do. Again. Honestly, I I that's been the fun part of this for me is getting to see like. You know, where are the little hiccups that I put in? What are the dumb things that people can do now? Mm -hmm. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity at play here. Oh, yeah. And anytime... Well, thank you for having me. This has been rather fun. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to talk about periphery, to talk about to talk about fantasy gaming, or just to shit post about the bar dying for the umpteenth time, uh, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Right on. Well, thank you for having me. This has been awesome. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>